Greetings. My name is Dr. Janet Joyner, and I would like to thank you for attending our online workshop titled HIPAA and Ethical Social Work Practice. I am your workshop presenter and will lead you through our virtual session. This online workshop is the equivalent of two hours of training content, and it is my hope that through your participation in this workshop, you will learn basic information on HIPAA and what we as practitioners can do to ensure the privacy and confidentiality of our clients' records. We know that in today's digital age, it can be very difficult protecting sensitive electronic files as well as digital devices from hacking. However, our clients entrust their most private thoughts and the details of their lives with us. Therefore, it becomes our professional and ethical responsibility not to mention our legal responsibility under HIPAA to do everything in our power to protect our clients' information from unauthorized users who might otherwise do them harm through the release of their personal information. I am hopeful the information I will share with you during this workshop will help guide you in your work, provide you strategies to enhance the cybersecurity of your records, and broaden your awareness of ethical social work practice in today's digital culture. So again, I thank you for your participation, and I look forward to engaging you here. On this slide, I've provided you a brief overview of what it is we'll be discussing during today's training. So during our time together, we'll be exploring best practices for online service delivery. We'll be discussing HIPAA compliance and challenges associated with compliance. We'll be discussing the NASW Code of Ethics and the technology standards, uh, the new technology use standards. We'll also be discussing the importance of developing a technology use as well as a social media policy. Now that you have a clear understanding of our major content areas that we'll be covering today, I'd like to provide you with objectives of what it is I hope you'll take away as a result of your participation in today's training. I'm hoping that you'll take away with you an increase awareness of the 2017 revised NASW Code of Ethics, as well as the 2017 NASW, ASWB, CSWE, and the CSWA Standards for Technology and Social Work Practice. I'm also hoping that you'll have a better understanding of what HIPAA is and why it is so very important to know HIPAA policy when engaging clients. I'm also hoping that you'll have a greater understanding of the importance of policy development. As social workers, we absolutely must understand policy development and be a part of the process. And that includes having your own organizational social media policy and a general technology use policy when, in, when you're engaging clients. And finally, I hope that you'll have a clear understanding of exactly what is meant by best practice. Many of us have heard the words best practices used in a variety of contexts. So for the purpose of this workshop, I would like to provide you a working definition of this concept of best practices. For the purpose of this workshop, our definition of best practice is actually taken from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines best practices as a procedure that has been shown by research and experience to produce optimal results and that has been established or proposed as a standard suitable for widespread adoption. So simply stated, best practices relies heavily on procedures and methods that have been shown to be effective based on previous research and experience. The plural form of best practice is simply, of course, best practices. As we explore the concept of best practices related to HIPAA technology and the NASW Code of Ethics, I would like us to first begin broadly thinking about what best practices means to us. I would like us to begin thinking about the importance of planning ahead and regularly engaging in risk management. So part of best practices means thinking ahead and regularly engaging in risk management. So best practices includes risk management and ongoing evaluation. Ongoing evaluation in order to maintain ideal organizational health and functioning. To underscore the importance of best practices, I would like to provide you my five top areas to ensure quality service delivery 
and as a positive side effect, you'll also be following the NASW Code of Ethics. So, number one in my five top areas in terms of best practices. Number one, on an annual basis, in a systemic and highly organized fashion, set aside time to review your organizational policies. Make sure that you fully understand them and that they are still current. Even within just one year's time, a policy can become outdated, antiquated, and just not simply meet the best needs of your clients and, and the people who work uh, for you and with you. Policies are items that can be viewed as dry and uninteresting, and they can be ignored until there is, of course, a crisis. So be aware and set annual reminders to review certain policies and make any necessary updates, and then ensure the people involved in service delivery, such as your clients, as well as, again, the people that you work with and work for, are provided copies of your policies that impact them. So some organizations and private practitioners even require employees to sign an annual statement confirming that they've actually received and reviewed the specific policies, such as the technology and social media use policies and procedures. So number one, again, set aside time on an annual basis to review your policy statements to make sure that they're up to date and then ensure that the people who are most directly impacted by those policies have a copy of those documents and also sign off to confirm that they've received them and that they also fully understand the policy. Number two, best practice number two. In order to reduce risk potential and to make sure that the technology you use uh, to regularly store data and engage your clients, such as smart devices, cloud-based storage platforms are all up to date. Don't kick the can. You'll hear me say this again a little bit later, but kicking the can means postponing updates to your security system because it might be a little inconvenient or because maybe you're not familiar with how to install the necessary updates. A best practice related to security updates involves hiring others with the expertise if you don't possess the expertise yourself. So again, Area number two, making sure that you don't kick the can and that you update your security systems so that, again, you have optimal functioning. Best practice number three, you absolutely must know what data you're collecting from your clients and from your staff before you have a crisis or security breach. If you don't know what information you have been storing, you won't be able to inform your clients and staff in the event you have a breach. So make sure to take action to protect your clients, and their identity. Try to limit the data that you're collecting regarding clients and, and staff members if you supervise others. And only collect data that is absolutely necessary in order to provide quality service. Regularly reviewing the data that you're storing and again, making sure that you have the highest possible privacy protocol in place uh, and to use the most up-to-date, um, again, uh, uh, practices will help to ensure um, optimal functioning. Also have a written plan or policy in terms of how long you intend to maintain records and your process for safely discarding data once that information is no longer available. Let's talk a little bit about best practice number four. Best practice number four, back up all your data so that you have a duplicate file in the event your smart device or laptop is stolen or compromised. This may seem like a no-brainer, but at this point, make sure that all electronic devices are also password protected at the very least. We've been hearing story after story for some time now um, about uh, organizations that have had breaches, security breaches. We've heard social media organizations. We've heard hospitals and medical facilities that have had their uh, clients' records accessed. So again, it's incredibly important to make sure that the devices that we're using are properly maintaining and storing data and that they have the proper safety protocols in place. Make sure that the, for example, the electronic devices that you may be using have password protected, protection at the very least. Um, password protection means having passwords that are not easily um, cracked by outsiders. 
Um, it's recommended, in fact, that you not simply use a password, that instead you use something like a phrase. A security password phrase might be something like, I like nachos with the number one behind it. Very difficult to crack that as a password when it's personal to the individual that is actually using it. So a password phrase is much more difficult uh, to crack or to break than a simple uh, random password. My best practice number five for online service delivery is to make sure that you again have installed on your devices uh, that you're using to store data and engage your clients uh, in an encryption protocol. Make sure that the apps that you use um, to store uh, clients' data, or if you're using a private proprietary system uh, that you purchase from uh, an outside vendor, make sure that it's encrypted so that when you're engaging clients using the Internet, social media, or through a mobile device, you have the highest, again, security platform or uh, protocol available. And make sure that when you're using these uh, uh, security systems that claim to be HIPAA compliant, uh, that they're also encrypted. So that's going to be important that you ask those very uh, challenging questions when you purchase uh, security protocol for your devices and for your systems. And consider installing apps and other tools that have the, case of the capability of disabling your device or cleaning your device or wiping the data uh, remotely in the event your data is compromised, in the event you lose or leave the uh, cell phone that has client data on it on a city bus or maybe at a restaurant. Make sure that you have the ability to wipe that uh, device clean in the event that that, uh, that system is actually opened by an outside user. Using public Wi-Fi is a no-no. Using public Wi-Fi is the equivalent of opening your front door and inviting in strangers into your home, people that you don't know when you're not at home. So using public Wi-Fi may present a clear pathway to someone interested in harvesting data for ill purposes. So again, it's important to never use public Wi-Fi, but to use maybe a hotspot device that provides you access to uh, the internet if you don't have that installed on your system. So those, again, are my top five areas for ensuring best practices. What is HIPAA? On your screen now is a cute little cartoon poking fun of best practices. It focuses on HIPAA. My point of sharing this cartoon is HIPAA, just like the concept of best practices, is widely used but may not be clearly understood. So what exactly is HIPAA? Let's start with the acronym. HIPAA is an acronym for Health Insurance, Portability, and Accountability Act. This act was passed by Congress in 1996, and the HIPAA policy was implemented to improve the effectiveness of the United States healthcare system. Congress later added provisions to HIPAA that required the adoption of federal privacy protections for individuals' identifiable health information. In the year 2000, for example, the United States Department of Health and Human Services introduced the privacy rule requirement of HIPAA. We talk a great deal about the privacy rule requirement within social work practice, but let's drill down a little bit further. Within the Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of Civil Rights, which is also known by its acronym, OCR, has the responsibility for implementing and enforcing what is known as the HIPAA privacy rule. The HIPAA privacy rule is related to specific uh, specifically to voluntary compliance activities and civil monetary uh, penalties that might incur or might be incurred as a result of violation of HIPAA. We'll talk about the HIPAA privacy rule a little bit later, but the United States Department of Health and Human Services published a final security rule in actually uh, 2003. The 2003 rule established national standards for protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of electronic protected health information. Compliance with the security rule was required as of April 20th in 2005, or April 20th, 2006, for small health plans. 
In 2009, Congress passed what is known as the High Tech Act. The High Tech Act, which is spelled H-I-T-E-C-H, Act, which is actually known as the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. Said again, the High Tech Act actually stands for Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. The High Tech Act was revised in 2013 and is really considered the catalyst for what, tri- for what actually triggered the adoption and the use of information technology throughout the healthcare system. So as consumers, we see the High Tech Act uh, in action through our ability to access our personal medical records um, using the Internet and through the use of specialized mobile apps. And even, believe it or not, through social media, many of us can access our medical records using social media apps. Many of us can even engage our doctors and other medical professionals using HIPAA compliant text, video, as well as audio based tools such as Teladoc. I personally actually uh, have a Teladoc account through my employer. So let's now move on to slide five, where we'll talk about your skills and limitations as relates to the NESW Code of Ethics. The NESW Code of Ethics encourages us as social workers to know our skills and limitations. Even though HIPAA and the High Tech Act provide social workers and others working in healthcare settings the ability to engage clients, patients, and others using a variety of information and communication technologies, or ICTs as they're called, uh, using these tools in direct practice, social workers may not be fully prepared or properly trained to engage clients using ICTs. ICTs include mobile devices, uh, cell phones, laptops, tablet devices, social media platforms like Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and others, as well as video and audio recording platforms such as Skype, VC, and VC, by the way, is spelled V as in Victor, S as in Sam, E as in electric, E as in electric. Uh, So VC is a Skype-like tool that is also HIPAA compliant, as mentioned previously. But in addition to these video and audio recording platforms like Skype, VC, WebEx, and others, Social workers might also lack awareness of different types of ICTs and how to actually use them. We may not be aware that ICTs uh, that are deemed HIPAA compliant, because not all ICTs, of course, are HIPAA compliant. But as social workers, we may not be aware how to identify uh, ICTs that are HIPAA compliant or how even to assess if the tools we're using with our clients are actually effective or even harmful. Are we using certain ICTs based on best practices? Those are questions that as social workers we must ask ourselves. Are we using these ICTs based on best practices? And if best practices do not exist because cyber social work or electronic social work as it's also called, is still in its infancy, do we know other practitioners who may have piloted uh, using certain ICTs that we can consult rather than going forward and using ICTs that we're not really familiar with how to use? Are there social work faculty, if they're not direct practitioners that we can call on to consult? Are there social work faculty in schools of social work and, and social work programs that have conducted maybe studies on using ICTs in direct practice that we can reach out to for feedback and direction? Knowing our professional skill limitations in this new technology economy is incredibly important. It is imperative that social workers choosing to use technology in direct practice know their gaps in training and then seek opportunities for continuing education and other training opportunities to fill those gaps. Attempting to provide client services in areas where we're unqualified or we lack the adequate knowledge and training not only places our clients at risk, but it also might be viewed as a violation of the NESW Code of Ethics. So let's take a little time now as we move on to our next slide to discuss the 2017 revised NESW Code of Ethics, as well as the NESW, ASWB, CSWE, and the Clinical Social Work Association standards related to the use of technology in direct practice.
You'll notice on this slide that there are two different pictures of two different publications. The very first publication is the revised 2017 NESW Code of Ethics, and the second publication is the 2017 NESW, CSWE, ASWB, and CSWA Standards for Technology and Social Work Practice. The purple booklet, which you'll see right here, is actually a standalone publication, but I think it works fantastically well as a companion piece to the Code of Ethics. The purple booklet helps to provide an interpretation of the technology standards found in the code, and it provides additional clarification and direction. It took nearly two years to develop this publication, and it built on content from the 2010 version, which was not nearly as comprehensive. The original NASW Code of Ethics, on the other hand, was first introduced to the social work membership in 1960, and since 1960, there have been eight major revisions to the Code of Ethics. Our current code, uh, NASW Code of Ethics, was reviewed and supported by the August 4th, 2017 NASW Delegate Assembly. I'm proud to have served as a delegate representing the state of Michigan that helped to vote in support of the new code that we are actually uh, following now as professional social workers. The revision of the Code of Ethics went into effect January 1st of 2018. And again, this is the publication that you see on your screen before you. So the current code that we're working under went into effect January 1 of 2018, but it was supported by the NESW uh, Delegate Assembly back in August of 2017. Recently, I had an opportunity to attend an NASW webinar sponsored by the National Office in Washington, D.C. And during this training, NASW staff indicated that the current Code of Ethics has 19 new and or amended standards that are specifically related to the use of technology in social work practice. 19 new and or amended standards specifically related to the use of technology in social work practice. The code's standards help guide the professional conduct of social workers, and given the explosion of ICTs, the NASW Code of Ethics also helps to raise social workers' awareness of ethical challenges associated with the use of technology. So again, our current code doesn't tell us what to do, but it makes recommendations around ethical challenges that social workers are likely to see. And again, the companion piece which looks at technology standards, helps to interpret some of the issues that we see within the code, some of the standards that are within the code. So I would like to take a few moments now to bring your attention to a few areas of the code that help to underscore the importance of social workers' ethical use of technology. So for example, on page four of the NESW Code of Ethics, on page four of this publication, readers are provided an overview of the purpose of the code, and in the very last sentence of the final paragraph, it specifically states that social workers should keep apprised of emerging technological developments that may be used in social work practice and how various ethical standards apply to them. Again, the current code tells us that social workers should keep apprised of emerging technological developments that may be used in social work practice and how various ethical standards apply to them. That statement can be found on page four of the 2017 Code of Ethics. I think this statement is really clear through the code. And through the code, NESW is emphasizing the importance of social workers continuing to educate themselves on current as well as future technologies and how our ethical standards apply to these technologies and their use. Let's take a few moments now to explore your technology use policy and or your social media policy. If you are in private practice and do not currently have these policy statements, you will definitely want to create them. If you work for a social welfare organization, I strongly encourage you to check your organizational website 
or your human resources office to secure a copy of your technology and or social media policies so that you're aware of your employer's expectations regarding the use of social media and not just with your clients. Some organizations have very clear expectations regarding employee use of the internet and social media during office hours, as well as during off hours. Some social workers engaging clients using technology and social media should have clear social media and technology use policies. These policies will help your clients understand your personal expectations, as well as your limitations associated with your use of technology and social media. You will also want to review these policies with your clients. Even if you're in private practice or, again, working for a human service organization, you still want to take the time to review your organizational policies regarding technology and social media with your clients. Even if you don't plan to use social media directly with your clients, it's recommended that you do develop these policies and that you review these policies with your clients and then provide your clients a copy of the same information. These policies will also serve as a reminder to you of how you intend to use technology or if you decide not to use technology and social media with your clients, it'll serve as a record and as a reminder to them as well as to yourself. NESW understands that using technology and social media in direct practice for many social workers may be a new experience. It may be a new experience for us as social workers because technology such as the internet and social media platforms are very quickly evolving. In fact, it seems like almost every day a new technology or internet-based internet tool is being introduced. So it can feel overwhelming and difficult to keep up with the new technologies and again, different types of social media platforms. NESW, through the newly revised Code of Ethics and the new standards for technology and social work practice, is attempting to address the challenges and ethical dilemmas social workers may face. I would like to bring your attention now uh, to the use of the NESW Code of Ethics on page nine. So I'd like to again bring your attention to this publication and have you look at page nine under standard 1.04, which is the standard governing competence. Under this standard, please take a look at item C, which specifically states, when generally recognized standards do not exist with respect to emerging areas of practice, social workers should exercise careful judgment and take reasonable steps, including appropriate education, research, training, consultation, and supervision to ensure the competence of their work and to protect their clients from harm. This is really important as we talk about integrating technology in our practice as social workers, that again, we get the proper education and training to ensure that we're competent to work with our clients using these tools. The Code of Ethics goes on and further states under item D, that social workers who use technology in the provision of services should ensure they have the necessary knowledge and the skills to provide such services in a competent manner. So again, the code is stating under item D that social workers who use technology in the provision of services should ensure they have the necessary knowledge and skills to provide such, such services in a competent manner. And this includes understanding of the special communication challenges when using technology and the ability to implement strategies to address these challenges. So as you work on developing or revising an existing social media policy, you should be aware there are many resources available to assist you as you develop your social media policy. And if you are a member of the NESW, you can simply visit the NESW website and locate many of those resources. When we began this workshop, I mentioned that we would spend some time discussing HIPAA challenges. 
And just as a friendly reminder, the acronym HIPAA means Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which was passed by Congress in 1996. HIPAA provides direction to those involved in healthcare service delivery regarding patient healthcare records and healthcare records protection. In short, HIPAA was designed to strengthen privacy and security for health information and associated records. I would like to, you to keep in mind as we talk about HIPAA and as I provide you this brief overview of HIPAA, that again, HIPAA was born in 1996. However, the High Tech Act of 2009 was instituted by the United States federal government and it encouraged as well as incentivized widespread adoption and use of electronic health records or also EHRs. The United States government encouraged, strongly encouraged doctors, medical care uh, staff, and again, medical facilities to use EHRs and incentivized it by giving institutions financial support. And this support was offered between 2011 and 2015 by the United States government. But after 2015, health or, healthcare organizations that failed to comply with instituting EHRs or electronic health records were actually penalized. So they were offered incentives for, for about four or five years. And after that time, they were then penalized if they didn't use electronic health care records. By the way, the acronym HITECH again stands for Health Information Technology and Economic and Clinical Health Care Act. That's the High Tech Act. So as we continue to explore HIPAA, it's important to discuss the storage of electronic files and the use of mobile devices, because we can't talk about HIPAA today if we're not talking about not just the storage of electronic files and keeping those files secure, but also talking about how we use mobile devices such as cell phones, laptops, tablets, and talking about how to keep those uh, devices secure. So we can't have a conversation about HIPAA without, again, talking about uh, safety of electronic records, but also safety of the digital devices that we use and the security risks and potential financial penalties for those that violate HIPAA rules. So under HIPAA, reasonable safeguards must be in place for covered entities. And these covered entities include physicians, nurses, social workers, and others with access to patient records. So again, medical care uh, individuals who handle patient records must implement reasonable administrative, technical, as well as physical safeguards to help protect private, uh, patient privacy. For example, HIPAA compliance standards include making sure that hard drives are erased prior to returning leased equipment that may have stored patient health information. It also requires or includes making sure the security software uh, slash encryption is actually installed on mobile devices used uh, to access personal uh, medical uh, records for our, for our patients. It also includes making sure not to discuss patient health care information in public places or where it can be overheard. So we're not just talking about physical or electronic storage of documents, records, patient information, but we're also talking about safeguarding and making sure that the devices that we're using, mobile devices, for example, that we're using have appropriate encryption and security software installed. We're also talking about making sure that we don't discuss clients or patients' uh, cases in public places where it can be overheard by others. And it also includes making sure that we properly dispose of client documents, physical documents, not just electronic, but paper documents, making sure that if we have uh, client records, that we have a shredding uh, protocol in place to, again, protect our clients' records. So it's, again, it is incredibly important that we not only uh, have these safeguards in place, but we have written protocols that actually govern what it is we do. That's a part of what HIPAA tells us, that we not only have a protocol in place, but we have a written record guiding our practices with each of those areas. Now, the NESW Code of Ethics helps to un underscore the importance of maintaining client privacy and confidentiality in electronic 
and personal communications. The NESW ethical standards, um, they're consistent with HIPAA, with HIPAA expectations. The ethical standards and the NESW code of ethics are consistent with HIPAA expectations. For example, I'd like to bring your attention now to section 1.07 of the NESW code of ethics. Section 1.07 covers privacy and confidentiality, which can be found on page 11 of the code. In this particular section, uh, this section alone has 24 different items specifically related to protecting clients' right to privacy. Again, this section has 24 different items that are specifically related to protecting our client's right to privacy, including not discussing client's confidential information unless privacy can be ensured. This section of the code also states that social workers should develop and inform their clients about policies related to their use of technology, the need to take reasonable steps to protect their client's confidentiality. So again, we in this section of the NESW Code of Ethics, we talk about uh, that social workers should develop and inform their clients about policies related to their use of technology, the need to take reasonable steps to protect client confidentiality, as well as what steps social workers will take in the event a breach of their client's records takes place. Now, these social work ethical standards are, again, consistent with HIPAA compliance expectations. On the previous slide, I discussed HIPAA and the importance of protecting patient records. I also underscored that the NESW is consistent with HIPAA expectations related to protection of client privacy and confidentiality. The NESW Code of Ethics is consistent with HIPAA, whether using electronic devices, the internet, or even through traditional verbal uh, communications with others. Today, one of the most difficult challenges associated with maintaining client or patient confidentiality and privacy is the potential for hacking and lost or stolen electronic devices, such as our cell phones, laptops, um, that may house client or patient data. At the same time, clients and patients are increasingly asking medical professionals, medical personnel to engage them using a variety of devices apps, and websites for convenience and ease of access to their information. As indicated earlier, the High Tech Act of 2009 encouraged, strongly encouraged, and then later penalized healthcare organizations if they failed to implement and use electronic health records. Some healthcare workers using institutional electronic devices to engage patients may lack the knowledge of encryption software. They may not know how to update the security settings on their organizational device uh, when an update is available, or they may simply not take the time to do so. Or maybe they may be using a password um, or not using password protection on their devices. As a result, regular organizational trainings related to HIPAA policies, understanding the importance of maintaining the highest possible security settings on your institutional assigned electronic device, and always, I cannot underscore this enough, but always using password protection on devices using hard-to-hack passwords will continue to be key to meeting HIPAA standards and those of the NASW Code of Ethics. I want you to have a few statistics as we talk about the importance of maintaining client confidentiality and privacy, as well as implementing the standards under HIPAA and the NASW Code of Ethics. I want you to know that according to the Physicians Practice Group, which is an organization that gathers research and provides national trainings to uh, the medical community, this organization con uh, conducted a research study recently, and they found that one laptop is stolen every 53 seconds. 
a laptop is stolen every 53 seconds. This group also found that 70 million smartphones are lost each year with only 7% being recovered. 70 million smartphones that are lost each year and only 7% are recovered. So if you're using an institutional assigned device, that becomes critical because you may have inst uh, client data or patient information stored on your digital device. This organization also found that 4.3% of company-issued smartphones are lost or stolen every year. That's a phenomenal percentage. 4.3% may not sound like a lot, but when you're looking at millions, um, potentially hundreds of thousands of smartphones, and that we have 4.3 that are stolen or lost every year, that becomes pretty phenomenal. I also want you to know that 80% um, of the cost of a lost laptop is based on a breach, or based on a data breach. 80% of the cost of a laptop is from a data breach. 52% of devices stolen from an office or workplace and 24% from conferences. That's staggering data. That's staggering data. The Physicians Practice Group also indicated that in 2015 alone, there were 52 breaches of 10,000 or more records involving just mobile devices. Again, in 2015 alone, that's just in one year, there were 52 specific data breaches related to 10,000 or more records involving mobile devices. And that figure is actually expected to jump to 82 in subsequent years. So those these data are pretty phenomenal as we talk about uh, data breaches and clients' data uh, being accessed. This organization also found that uh, 78 healthcare data breaches uh, were reported in 2017, which involved 10,000 or more records. And additionally, an analysis of data conducted uh, found that mislaid, stolen, or discord, discarded, that is, uh, public, public portable devices cause records with personally identifying information of nearly 80 million individuals to be breached. I need to say that again because, again, we need to know this as uh, social work practitioners working in settings where HIPAA is one of the expectations that we follow these protocols. So I'm going to repeat this data uh, bullet for you. An analysis of, analysis of data concluded that mislaid, taking a device and laying it down and forgetting that you've left it there, stolen or discarded portable devices caused records with personally identifying information of 80 plus million individuals to be breached. So that's that simply means that when we misplace or a document or a device is stolen or discarded for that, uh, for that matter, that we put our clients' information at risk. We put our patients' personal health care records at risk. And these statistics underscore that it is imperative as we continue to engage our clients and patients in healthcare service delivery settings and others that we improve the ways in which we use technology. So it's not simply just the way that we use technology, but it's how we use technology to store our clients' records. Technology and ICTs, um, such as mobile devices, have helped increase access to services for our clients and our patients. But as social workers, we must continue to use safeguards to protect client confidentiality and privacy. I cannot say that enough. So what are the penalties for those who fail to maintain HIPAA standards? We've talked about the importance, but we've not talked about the penalties, the financial penalties that might uh, exist for those that fail to comply with these standards. The penalties for HIPAA noncompliance will vary based on the level of negligence. So it depends on the infraction. It depends on the violation. And if the violation is a repeat, meaning the person has had a re been a repeat offender, then the violation goes up. So generally speaking, violations can range anywhere from $100 to $50,000 per violation or per record, uh, with the maximum penalty being about $1.5 million per year uh, for a specific violation. So again, it's important 
that in order to avoid these charges that we comply with HIPAA guidelines. So on the next slide, you'll see a short snapshot of several 2017 HIPAA violators as shared by the physician's practice group. On this slide, I'm sharing with you a snapshot of the 2017 HIPAA penalties as shared by the Physicians Practice Group in 2018 in their 2018 report. Um, as mentioned on the previous slide, the penalties for HIPAA noncompliance will vary based on the level of negligence, the violation, and if the violation is a repeat, that is, the violation occurred previously. Generally speaking, violations can range anywhere from $100 to $50,000 per violation or per record, with a maximum penalty of $1.5 million per year for violations of an identical uh, provision or for repeat. As we continue to discuss HIPAA, it's important that you have an awareness of the HIPAA breach notification rule. The HIPAA breach notification rule requires covered entities as well as their business associates to provide notification following a breach of protected health information. Again, protected health information includes the patient's name, social security number, any credit card information that may be on file, notes that are entered by a physician, nurse, social worker, or other healthcare professional about the client, the client's prescription information, health conditions or diagnosis, and much, much more. It is critical to act when a breach occurs because when a breach occurs, a person's health information is quickly compromised and parts of their identity and health records can quickly be sold to multiple players. In addition, some employers conduct credit worthiness background checks and may not hire an individual with poor credit histories. And again, for some individuals experiencing a breach of their health care information, their poor credit history may be brought about as a result of the breach of their, their background information. So individuals impacted by these breaches can also be impacted by insurance companies, for example, who offer discounts for good credit, and they may not qualify for these discounts, again, based on uh, the abuse of their credit by others who may have gained access to it as a result of a breach. So as we talk about or continue to talk about the importance of maintaining client confidentiality, I have provided you here additional information, a link that will provide you additional information about a breach, as well as what information must be uh, included. As we continue talking about the breach, it's important that breach notification, it's important that you know that breach notification applies to both paper as well as electronic records. There can be criminal as well as civil penalties for those who fail to comply with breach notification requirements. Again, as a resource, I provided you on this particular slide additional information uh, that you can access by visiting the socialworkers.org website where you'll find a great deal of information related to HIPAA and HIPAA help for social workers. And not to worry, if the print on this particular slide is too small, I'll also provide you a link on this page that will take you directly to this uh, website where you can find additional information. On the subsequent slides that we will be covering the, uh, in the next couple of minutes, we'll be talking about the policies and procedures that must be in place to reduce the risk of data breaches, especially as it relates to portable devices and digital systems. What policies and procedures need to be in place to reduce the risk 
of data breaches, especially as we talk about portal dev portable devices and uh, digital systems. As we explore the, what policies and procedures need to be in place to reduce the risk of data breaches, we must remind ourselves that in today's digital culture, there are absolutely no cybersecurity guarantees. We have a long list of companies like Facebook, MyFitnessPal, the United States government, Sony, Target, and a multitude of others that likely had access to the highest possible security systems and standards designed to protect their customers' records and accounts. While this is the case, as social workers, we still must make every effort possible to protect client and patient privacy and confidentiality in this new digital age. This statement is supported by the NASW Code of Ethics, and for example, I am reminded, as I think about security standards, of Standard 1.07 under Item M in the Code of Ethics, which states, uh, social workers should take reasonable steps to protect the confidentiality of electronic communications, including information provided to clients or third parties. Social workers should use applicable safeguards such as encryptions, uh, firewalls, and passwords when using electronic communications such as email, online posts, online chat sessions, mobile communications, and text messages. So in answering the question what policies and procedures need to be in place to reduce the risk of data breaches, especially with regard to portable devices and digital systems, the answer, I think, is very clear. At a very minimum, there must be an actual policy. So as we talk about what policies and procedures need to be in place, there absolutely must be a policy that governs privacy and confidentiality within your organization. Or if you're a private practitioner, there needs to be developed a policy that specifically talks about security and data breaches. Now, the policy must provide employees, if, once you develop your policy, it must provide employees with specific behavioral expectations. It can't just simply be a general policy, but it should spell out specifically what you expect of the staff that work directly with your clients so that they know what behavioral expectations you have of them, such as not using social media to discuss clients. Those kinds of issues must be specifically spelled out in your policy. And as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, your policies should be evaluated on an annual basis to ensure they're still re relevant and still apply. For example, a company mobile device use policy and a separate social media policy should provide the basis of these use policies. So again, what policies should be developed? a separate social media policy, as well as a technology use policy, policies related to how your uh, staff will use digital devices, and whether or not you give them approval to use social media and how to use social media. Now, are we trying to legislate behavior? No, we're not. But in the digital age, in the absence of direction, people are left to their own devices to make decisions. And we don't want our, our staff making decisions that place our clients and our patients in jeopardy. A company data breach policy should also be developed, which provides clear instructions or steps that should be taken in the event of a data breach. When developing a mobile device use policy, it might be interesting to know the common mobile security breaches. Knowing what those common mobile security breaches are will help to inform you as you develop your policy. Perhaps the most common breach to a mobile device is likely staff members unintentionally leaving their device in a taxi, maybe in a restaurant, or even on public transportation like a city bus. Secondly, Staff unknowingly open the door to malware on their devices. They may not know that going and using an open, unsecure Wi-Fi network at maybe a coffee shop or department store or some other uh, public place can place their device in jeopardy, therefore placing their clients' privacy and confidentiality at risk.
Once malware gains access to just one singular mobile device in a network, an organizational network, it can leave the entire organization's IT system vulnerable for hacking and can infect the entire network of all connected devices. So staff must be informed specifically of their organizational policy that they are not to download software that has not first been approved by IT. In fact, even though an organization's policy might inform employees that they should be careful not to leave their devices unintended, unattended that is, and not to use public Wi-Fi and to avoid downloading emails from accounts they don't recognize, as a safeguard, all organizational mobile devices should also be equipped with a block or an app that does not allow access to outside websites. So again, as we're talking about what policies need to be developed, we talked about specific technology use policies, social media policies, policies governing how uh, staff use the devices that are uh, assigned to them by the organization. But aside from that, staff also need to know that they are not to use public Wi-Fi. These are items that should be specifically spelled out in a social media or technology organizational use policy. So all organizational devices should be equipped, if it is all possible, with a block that does not allow access to outside websites. Additionally, companies might consider providing staff when they provide staff devices, they might also consider giving placing Wi-Fi on those devices. Yes, it can be expensive to have a separate network where you're supplying your staff with Wi-Fi access, but it is far better and less expensive to provide Wi-Fi access on a device than to have your staff using an open network and have that uh, network become breached because then you're talking about having to purchase new devices and potentially the time it takes to rebuild your IT system after it has been infected. So these are some of the policies and procedures that should be in place to reduce the risk of, uh, of a breach of your organizational mobile devices and other tools that are used, other technology tools that are used. What protocols should be followed in the event of a breach? Who needs to be notified and what are the timelines that are involved? It is highly recommended that you have a written plan in place in the event of a data breach and that all employees knew about this plan. There should be no surprise at all as time will be crucial in the event there is indeed a data breach. Each moment lost, is potentially costing your clients their identity. So it is, again, critical to act quickly in the event of a data breach. In the event of a breach, inform your supervisor immediately and then execute the plan. IT, your IT department, that is, should be notified or those responsible for technology in your organization should immediately be notified. You and your organization will need to inform all individuals impacted by a security breach in writing within 60 days of your learning of the breach. These are HIPAA requirements. Again, within 60 days of your learning about the breach, you or your organization, the individual within your organization responsible for this notification, will need to inform all individuals impacted by the security breach in writing. If a breach occurs involving 500 or more individuals, those impacted must be contacted first by first class mail as well as email if the individual agree to receive information electronically. So again, in the event of a breach involving 500 or more individuals, those impacted by the breach must be contacted by first class mail as well as email only if they agree to receive information electronically, but 
by first class mail is a requirement. Information related to the breach must be posted on the offending organization's website for a minimum of 90 days. So again, we're going to notify those impacted by the breach immediately. We're going to notify them in writing by U.S. mail, and we'll also follow up with an email if they agree to be notified also by email. In addition, we're going to post the information on our website for a minimum of 90 days. The offending organization must also notify the Federal Health and Human Services Secretary and report the incident. In addition to HIPAA protocols that must be followed in the case of a breach, the NESW Code of Ethics also provides social workers with direction. Again, we've mentioned Standard 1.07, Privacy and Confidentiality, previously, but this particular standard also speaks in terms of a breach. So Standard 1.07, Privacy and Confidentiality, has several items that addresses this concern including item N, which states social workers should develop and disclose policies and procedures for notifying clients of any breach of confidential information in a timely manner. And item O of this same exact standard also indicates that in the event of unauthorized access to client records or information, including any unauthorized access to the social worker's electronic communication or storage systems, the social workers must inform clients of such disclosures. And this disclosure is consistent with applicable laws and professional standards. This information can be found on page 13 of the NESW Code of Ethics. So how will you use technology with your clients? As social workers, we must be very thoughtful when considering how we will use technology with our clients. The NESW Code of Ethics, Standard 1.03, Informed Consent. Under Item E, which can be found on page 8, it indicates that social workers should discuss with their clients the social workers' policies concerning the use of technology in the provision of professional services. Furthermore, under item F, it states that social workers who use technology to provide social work services should obtain information or should obtain consent, that is, from the individuals using these services during the initial screening or during the interview prior to initiating services. Social workers should assess clients' capacity to provide informed consent and when using technology to communicate, verify the identity and the location of your clients. So it's not enough to simply uh, use the technology with their, our clients, but it's important to assess their ability to use the technology as well as confirm their location when you do engage in using technology with clients. In addition, you might explore creative ways to verify your client's identity, such as using a special password that your client will share with you. However, verifying your client's location will require that you ask the client to provide you this information. We want to be mindful that as licensed social workers, we can only work with clients residing in the state where we're fully licensed. So if you're licensed in the state of Michigan, that means you can work with clients across the state of Michigan, including the Upper Peninsula. But if you're not licensed beyond the state of Michigan, you cannot provide services to your clients out state. When determining how you'll use technology with your clients, as I mentioned earlier, it's important to remember that just one singular infected device, like a cell phone, a tablet device, or desktop or a laptop, can, can actually corrupt or infect an entire company's system. A, com a compromised device can simply open the door to infecting the entire company's network. So it's important that when using technology, password protection is key. When using a device for work, use password protection. I cannot underscore that enough. 
if you're using now or in the future your company's cell phone or tablet uh, device in the field, make sure that the device you're using is encrypted, as I mentioned earlier, and also has an option to wipe the device clean of any personal data in the event the uh, device that you're using is compromised, lost, or stolen. Don't make any assumptions that your company uh, has provided the mobile device, that the uh, device your company has provided is secure. Don't make any assumptions about that. It's important to ask when you receive the device if the device is actually secure and whether or not the device has encryption software installed on it. When you receive the device, if you're receiving a device from an employer, make sure you know how and when the updates will be made to the device to ensure that the system remains protected. With most devices, the device might uh, have uh, software installed that uh, needs to be updated on an annual basis. So if it needs to be updated on an annual basis, it's important to know how to do that and who should do that. If it's your personal laptop, uh, your personal laptop will send you notices informing you when an, a security update is available. So again, as I, intend, uh, as I indicated earlier, it's so important not to kick the can. Don't postpone security updates that are due on your computer or on one of your mobile devices. If you don't understand the update uh, process, you can ask for help from IT, uh, your instructional technology department. And if you don't have an IT department, it's well worth paying a reputable source to conduct the updates for you. It is far better to pay for a software update rather than a HIPAA violation. You also want to be mindful you when using technology with your clients to never, ever, ever use open Wi-Fi networks or public uh, networks. Um, public networks are those that you might access through your public library, uh, in area coffee shop, uh, department stores, uh, oftentimes have free Wi-Fi. So you want to avoid those open Wi-Fi networks because those can be very vulnerable. Uh, these, uh, these open websites, uh, open, open Wi-Fi networks, I should say, can be vulnerable for hacking. And again, you don't want to put yourself in a position where that might be possible. So prior to using technology with your clients, make sure that you are aware of your company's social media policy and discuss this social media policy with your clients to make sure that they, too, also understand. If your organization does not have a social media policy, consider drafting it. You can draft the policy and actually share it with your supervisor to request uh, consideration for adoption. If you're in private practice as a social worker, you will absolutely want to develop your own social media policy and technology use statement that you'll be using with your clients. You'll make sure that if you're in private practice that you uh, have your, and your clients provided a copy of the social media and technology use policies, as well as secure their signature and the date to ensure that they've actually received it and confirmed that they've actually received it. Now, this statement regarding uh, development of social media policies and making sure that you uh, share those policies with your clients and to obtain their signature is also consistent with the NESW Code of Ethics. Uh, under the NESW Code of Ethics, for example, uh, under Section 1.08, uh, which focuses on access to records, I'd like to bring your attention to Item B, which can be found on page 14 of the Code of Ethics. Item B states that social workers should develop and inform clients about their policies consistent with the prevailing social work ethical standards on the use of technology to provide clients with access to their records. So again, uh, it's important to ensure that your clients understand and that they are provided a copy of the social media and technology use policies. When using technology with your clients, we want to make sure that we're using HIPAA compliant tools and that our clients also have access to, to the tools and possess the knowledge and skills to use the HIPAA compliant tool. We must ensure uh, our clients have access to high speed internet. If they don't have access to high speed internet, uh, they may have lots of stops and starts during the course of their work with you, which can be very frustrating and off-putting. Uh, so we want to keep these items in mind as we talk about using technology with our clients. 
In the next slide, we'll be talking about HIPAA compliant communication platforms and others. Based on what you've learned thus far in this workshop, I would like to have you take a few moments now to explore your personal thoughts and perceptions about cyber social work and online service delivery. I would like you to think carefully about what early messages you may have received about online therapy and treatment delivered through text messages, instant messages, asynchronous as well as synchronous audio and video conferencing, telephone, and other digital methods. I would like you to also think about how the early messages you may have received may have influenced your work with your current clients and your level of interest using digital tools to engage current and future clients. I would like you to explore if you currently believe you are adequately prepared to deliver digital services to clients, and if not, what additional training you believe you may need to do so ethically as well as competently. The exercise I would like you to now engage in will take approximately 20 minutes to complete. Please begin this exercise by viewing the 10-minute YouTube video I have provided. Before viewing the video, please keep in mind that licensed social workers can only practice in the state in which they're licensed. The video I would like you to view is related to a millennial using text-based asynchronous therapy and using an asynchronous therapy platform called Talkspace. Talkspace is a digital tool that can be used by both therapists as well as their clients at their own convenience, but it's not specific to social work. As a result, social workers electing to use Talkspace should do so and also make sure that they carefully follow the NESW Code of Ethics and related licensing rules. After you view the video, please go to the very next slide and answer the questions that I've provided. Your answers to these questions are designed to help you think critically about your perceptions about online service delivery. You will not submit your answers as part of this workshop, but you're, you are encouraged to review your answers to help you explore any personal gaps in current knowledge and skills, as well as your own perceptions about cyber service delivery. Thank you for taking time to view the video on the previous slide related to one person's experiences engaging in online service delivery. I would now like to engage you in an exercise. This exercise should take you 10 to 15 minutes to complete and is based only on your individual beliefs and experiences. Again, you will not submit your answers to these five questions uh, as part of the workshop, but you are encouraged to review your answers again later to help you explore any personal gaps in your current knowledge and skills and your perceptions and or any misperceptions you may have had about cyber social work and online service delivery. So let's take time now to answer each of the five questions that you see on the screen before you. There are many different web-based uh, video communication platforms today on the market that claim to be HIPAA compliant. While some of these platforms claim to be HIPAA compliant, they may not be. So it is imperative if you're planning to use technology with your clients and you're planning to use video-based communication platforms, for example, it is imperative that you conduct research on all the tools that you may be interested in using in order to protect your client's privacy and confidentiality. You will want to select digital communication tools that are not only HIPAA compliant, but are also user friendly. If you're planning to use synchronous audio video uh, communication platforms with your clients, synchronous platforms are those that you and your clients can engage in together in real time, like Skype, for example. So if you're planning to use synchronous audio video uh, communication platforms with your clients, I would encourage you to have more than one tool that you can use in the event you experience a technical difficulty. 
Know that technology does not always behave, and this will help you to prepare and your client to prepare for a successful online experience. The NESW Code of Ethics also discusses interruption of services under Standard 1.15, which can be found on page 17 of the NESW Code of Ethics. This specific standard states that social workers should make reasonable efforts to ensure continuity of services in the event that services are interrupted by factors such as unavailability, disruptions in electronic communication, relocation, illness, mental or physical ability, or even death. So as you prepare your clients for online service delivery, make sure that you communicate a backup plan for engagement with your clients prior to experiencing a technical issue. This will give you and your clients direction so that you'll know what steps to take. Having a backup plan will help to decrease any possible frustration, anxiety, both yours and your clients, and the disappointment that can happen when technology issues occur. So if you're planning to use an asynchronous platform, an asynchronous platform is a platform that is not used in real time. So if you're planning to use an asynchronous platform, which are those that you can use to communicate, but are not necessarily, as I mentioned, in real time, those include tools like texting or instant messaging, Again, you'll want to make sure that the tool you use is secure and encrypted. Texting and instant messaging can be used in both real time, synchronously, or they can be delayed asynchronously, depending on the availability of the participants. There are a few HIPAA compliant video based communication platforms that I've used in my practice as both a, a professor and a professional trainer. I've enjoyed using Skype for business and another tool called VC. VC can be used on a desktop or any mobile device. It has a free version that allows uh, for use with individuals as well as groups. I've also had personal experience using Skype for Business. Skype for Business indicates that it is actually HIPAA compliant. However, please be aware that there are two different versions of Skype. The regular free version of Skype is not HIPAA compliant but Skype for Business is HIPAA compliant and it also carries a fee. Skype for Business is typically available to organizations, agencies, colleges and universities, as well as other institutions. So again, if considering using a video uh, recording tool, you'll want to make sure that you're using a tool that is HIPAA compliant. I've also had experience using tools like GoToMeeting, uh, WebEx, Zoom conferencing, Google Hangouts, and a variety of other platforms. Again, there are quite a few different platforms that are available on, on the market today, and so we just want to be aware of those tools if we consider using them with our clients. Now, I mentioned that uh, I've used a tool called Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts is not a new platform. It's been around for several years now. But while I think uh, Google Hangouts is very easy to use, it allows you to use screen capture of your sessions so you can record your, your video sessions with your clients or meetings that you may have. It works great with other Google, tool, other Google tools, but I want you to know that it's not considered HIPAA compliant. Uh, the other tools that I mentioned are HIPAA compliant, uh, such as GoToMeeting, WebEx, uh, Zoom conferencing, those tools are actually HIPAA client compliant. But again, before using any of the tools with your clients, you always want to conduct your own background research just to ensure the information that you're receiving is considered up to date. As we take time now to discuss developing your technology use policy, I would like to first emphasize that your technology use policy can be a separate and freestanding policy from that of your social media policy. A technology use policy can include a checklist of items clients should have access to if they wish to engage in cyber social work or online service delivery. For example, 
Your technology use policy checklist can include several of the items recently discussed on the previous slides, such as confirming if the client has knowledge of how to use uh, video-based conferencing tools such as Skype for Business, VC, and others. A technology use policy can also include, number one, a protocol that the social worker and the client will use in the event technology fails. Sometimes technology simply does not behave and you will want to avoid burning through your client's precious counseling time trying to problem solve how to address an issue with technology. Number two, your technology use policy can include a link to a training video to ensure your client knows how to use the technology you'll be using to engage each other. So if you're going to be using, for example, VC or Skype for Business, there are plenty of YouTube videos that you can provide your clients a link to so that they can learn how to use the technology more effectively with you. Number three. Your technology use policy can include specific actions that you will take, the two of you will take, based on certain circumstances that might occur. For example, your policy could include radio silence. Radio silence is an action that you and your client can take in the event there is a physical breach during your counseling session. A physical breach during your counseling session. So what that means is when you're online with your client, someone may enter that space, that virtual space, and you and your client will want to know what actions you should take in the event of a breach. For example, I once supervised a cyber intern who was placed at a charter school and worked with high schoolers as part of a grant-funded virtual after-school pilot research project. During my cyber intern's online session with her mentees, one of the mentee's family members walked into camera view and saw the intern on the computer screen and made a comment. We did not anticipate this breach. We could not possibly have anticipated that breach. So during my follow-up supervisory session with my cyber intern, we discussed what we now call radio silence. Moving forward, my cyber intern and her mentees had a plan if a future session were compromised physically by a non-participant. The cyber mentor, the cyber intern that is, and her mentees were instructed in the event of a breach to immediately cover their laptop webcam and to remain silent until the breach was resolved. Radio silence is a strategy that can be used in any online session to protect the safety, privacy, and confidentiality of, uh, of participants. Now, again, while we can't anticipate every single situation that might occur during online service delivery, I want us to be aware of what can happen and what we might include in our technology use policy to help, again, protect the privacy and confidentiality of our clients. So, number four, as we talk about developing your technology use policy, if you're planning to use text messaging as a communication platform for counseling, uh, your client should be expected to have an unlimited text servicing plan. If you're planning to use texting as a platform to communicate with your, with your clients, you will want your client to have an unlimited texting service plan so that your communication with that client is not compromised. Number five, in your policy, I highly recommend that you indicate if you're going to be available to your client during off hours. Your client may experience a crisis and they may think it's perfectly okay to text you during off hours. So your policy should have a statement about whether or not you plan to respond to text messages received during off hours. You'll want to inform your client and then make sure you don't violate your own policy. For example, your client might text you after hours to confirm the, the uh, time of their appointment, which might be occurring the very next day. So for your client, that might be seen as an emergency because they will want to make sure that they don't miss their scheduled appointment. But as the counselor, as the social worker, if you respond to that client's text message after you've indicated in your policy statement that you will not be responding to text messages received uh, during office hours, you're really communicating to that client that you will respond. So in the event that client has 
a crisis or an emergency and then you fail to communicate, you may be uh, liable for that. You may be responsible in some way for that. So again, it's important that you communicate very specifically what your policies are and then really to try not to violate those policies. So again, in the example just provided, your uh, client actually sends you a text message during off hours to confirm their scheduled appointment with you. You've indicated in your policy that the, you will not be responding to uh, messages received after hours. If you respond to that client's message, again, indicating, confirming the time of their appointment, you will want to then confirm that they are not to contact you using this method of communication during off hours. And then during your next scheduled appointment with the client, you will again want to confirm that they understand they are not to contact you during off hours. You may wish to uh, retrieve your policy statement, which again communicates expectations around communication during off hours. Finally, number six, in your policy statement, I recommend, I encourage you in fact, to include a statement regarding location confirmation with your client. I am encouraging you to include the statement of location confirmation so that your client understands they may only engage you in cyberspace when they are physically located in the state of Michigan or in the state in which you are formally licensed. We know that as professional social workers, we can only work with clients in the state in which we're licensed. If we engage with clients that are not in the state in which we're licensed, then we uh, run the risk of violating the code of ethics. So I also encourage you to confirm your client's physical location during each session, during each cyber session you have with your clients. You may wish to confirm your client's location using a special password that you both agree upon prior to your counseling sessions. You will want to confirm your client's session in the event there's an emergency or a crisis that occurs during your session. And again, it helps you to not run afoul of state licensure laws. Given increased incidents of liability from data breaches and lost or stolen digital devices with client data, cyber liability insurance policies are now available to social workers, I'm very pleased to report. The insurance arm of the NASW is called NASW Assurance Services, and it offers cyber liability insurance policies for NASW members at a discounted rate. For details on cyber liability insurance rates, you can call 1-888-278-0038. And not to worry, I'll provide uh, an additional slide on this page with the telephone number as well as the NESW Assurance website. On the NESW Assurance website, it indicates that cyber liability insurance coverage for small practices and social worker agencies is still relatively new to the insurance field. With the exception of NESW Risk Retention Group, virtually no insurance carriers actually offer cyber liability insurance at an affordable uh, insurance addition for social workers. Those few carriers who do offer cyber liability insurance policies for social workers only offer it to social work agencies and not typically uh, individual social workers or social work private practitioners. Some professional liability insurance policies provide uh, data breach coverage if the breach occurs within the control of the practitioner only. But the NASW Risk Retention Group provides professional liability insurance protection that covers data, breach con uh, data breaches that are within the control of the practitioner. Now, NASW Ret uh, Risk Retention Group also provides a new cyber liability and breach of patient data privacy insurance policy that protects the practitioner from many other breach occurrences, including security breach damages, civil monetary penalties, and defense expenses. The NESW Assurance Cyber Liability uh, Policy actually covers reasonable costs uh, 
uh, to notify individuals that are affected by the breach. And the policy also provides a one-year subscription reimbursement benefit for identity theft protection. The policy also covers legal defense costs if a claim is made against the social worker by an individual affected by the breach, or if a state or federal regulator brings a civil action against the social worker. The policy also covers damages that the social worker is legally obligated to pay under court judgment or out-of-pocket court settlement costs and any civil fines or penalties that the social worker must pay because of the breach. And the policy also covers costs that are incurred by the social worker to notify her patients that the breach actually occurred. Now that we've explored HIPAA reporting rules and violations, the NASW Code of Ethics, cyber liability insurance, I would now like to return our attention briefly to risk reduction and uh, prevention. To reduce the potential for harm to clients, I would like to make several recommendations related to risk reduction and prevention. Prior to engaging in cyber social work or online service delivery, I recommend practitioners begin by talking to those already delivering cyber social work services to gain additional direction and feedback and to improve their ability to anticipate certain risks. If you are a supervisor in a traditional social work agency setting or human service agency, and you're interested in expanding your services using technology with your clients, I encourage you to first begin by ensuring your staff is properly trained and that they fully understand your organization's expectations for online engagement, including those related to any social media policies during off hours. All social workers should also review uh, the revised NESW Code of Ethics that became effective January 1st, 2018. In addition, I strongly encourage those interested in online service delivery to secure and read a copy of the 2017 NESW, ASWB, CSWE, and CSWA Standards for Technology and Social Work Practice. When possible, please attend an extended social work CE training or professional development workshop that builds on the content that you learn through this workshop today. There are additional workshops that provide extended content on each of the three topics covered in today's two hour session. These extended workshops provide additional information on HIPAA, the NESW code of ethics and the use of technology, as well as best practices in online service delivery. Making sure that you're fully knowledgeable about these major content areas will help reduce your potential risk for client breach of data, practice liability when engaging clients in cyberspace, while also ensuring that you fully understand ethical practice and service delivery expectations. Today is an absolutely amazing time to be a social worker. We have access to digital tools and are developing creative methods of practice and intervention strategies that enable us to work with individuals challenged by contemporary social problems that were unseen by previous generations. Some of the issues our clients are presenting to us in practice today did not exist even just a decade ago. For example, issues like e-trauma or electronic uh, trauma, which can occur when individuals unexpectedly witness an act of violence and or death live as it occurs on social media or on, or on the internet. Other social issues based on our use and misuse of technology include digital dementia, uh, and digital dementia is an issue that we first saw emerge from the medical research literature in the early 2000s. Digital dementia is an issue primarily impacting teens and young adults and is rooted in memory loss due to excessive use of technology. Nomophobia is another area that we're seeing in practice today. Nomophobia uh, occurs when people become paralyzed by the fear of being without their mobile device. No mo, no mo, bo. 
In spite of these contemporary digital mental health challenges, I am pleased to say that social work educators and clinical practitioners across the country are adding to the burgeoning body of research related to these social issues born out of the digital age. Understanding the diverse role of social work practice while ensuring we have the requisite skills and training necessary to address these issues ethically is critical to the future of our profession. As we prepare now to end our session on HIPAA and ethical social work practice, on the next slide, I would like to take a moment to summarize what it is we covered in this training. We've now reached the end of our workshop today, and I'd like to provide you a summary of what it is we discussed. In our workshop, we discussed best practices, and I provided you several best practice strategies for online service delivery. We also discussed what HIPAA means, as well as HIPAA compliance expectations, challenges, as well as the financial penalties associated with breaches of HIPAA. We also discussed both the 2017 revised NESW Code of Ethics, as well as the standards for technology and social work practice. We discussed the importance of having a plan when engaging clients online, the importance of developing a technology use policy, social media policies, as well as the importance of cyber liability insurance that can be purchased through the insurance arm of NESW called NASW Assurance. I'd like to thank you so very much for taking time to attend our workshop today, and I hope to see you at a future social work and technology workshop soon. Take good care.